Yo what's up, it's someone that's no one, and welcome back to another Substance Explained video. Today we're getting into Salvinorin B, a semi-synthetic version of Salvia that's 10 times as powerful and lasts 2-3 hours compared to standard Salvia. Salvia is considered to be the strongest naturally occurring hallucinogen, and those that have tripped off of it often do say it can be one of the most trippiest, weirdest experiences one can go through. It's often inhuman. You can become an inanimate object and whatnot while having a complete loss of ego. So the fact that there exists a substance that's possibly 10 times as strong, I just feel like we had to cover this here and break it down. Some of the wackiest reports I've read are salvia reports. And my experience with it too sticks out as one of the most all-powerful substances I've ever tried. It's honestly so bizarre to think that there can be something 10 times as strong as that experience. Because that experience feels like it can encapsulate just about anything and everything. And more than that. But this substance does exist. And it's not like it's anything new. It's been around since the mid-2000s. So there is some history and even reports with this substance. We'll get into this and more in this video. We'll break down the chemistry, the pharmacology, its limited usage, how it's made, the limited research done on it, and pretty much anything relevant to Salvinor and B, the many different versions that there are. What I present here is really interesting and does make you think what else could be possible considering the world of synthesizing hallucinogens, especially semi-synthetic things. You'll just see. Let me know what I should cover next though, and make sure to like and subscribe if you do enjoy. Besides that, without further ado, let's dive right into this. So we're going to start with the origins of this substance. Technically, this is a naturally occurring compound within Salvia Devonorum, but it hasn't been explored that much because the contents of Salvia B are so much lower compared to Salvia A. We'll talk about Salvia Devonorum more in another video, as there's tons of history behind it academically, with the culture, and much more from centuries past. Salvia B, however, has a much more shorter history, with the first studies of it popping up in 2005. It was first synthesized by David Lee and his team. They were seeking to understand Salvinorin A derivatives better and their relationship with the brain, specifically the kappa opioid receptors, which we will be mentioning a lot here. If you don't know, it has been found that the main effects of Salvia is due to its activity with these receptors. But they acquired Salvinorin B by a deacetylation process of Salvinorin A. Like I said, the quantity content really matters with this. Some modifications, and we can now get a substantial amount of Salvinorin B, instead of needing a ton of plant material and doing it a more difficult way. And I should say now that Salvinorin B was found in differing forms. They produce about 8 different derivatives. The base simple Salvinorin B is actually pretty weak, having 80 times less binding efficiency at the kappa opioid receptor. Not very impressive, and we wouldn't be making this video if it was just that. A different form though, Salvinorin B methoxymethyl ether showed to have a potency 7 times more than Salvinorin A. And this finding here itself is what partially influenced a small chunk of research to come in the following years. Obviously this would spark some interest, and not necessarily just in terms of tripping. Yes some actual research and trip reports came of this, but it's also important as it can be a useful tool. It has shown to be a full agonist, which I mainly mean tool as in potential medicine. Certain conditions and peoples, certain situations, could call for the use of this. And even beyond that, in terms of trying to research and understand these receptors better, it could make that easier. Especially when a substance shows to be on the far extreme end of a spectrum, that is, when it's a lot stronger than what's currently available, whether that be as an agonist or antagonist, or even partial agonist, it has a lot of potential for research and other usefulness. That could possibly mean that it's very dangerous as well though. It may not have any of those uses. But in this case with the kappa opioid receptors, at the very least, it gives some potential to understand a little more about this activity, or possibly a whole lot more. We have seen potential uses involving things like mood, as a painkiller, a water diuretic, or even as an antipyretic drug. But this is how Salvinorin B started, let's get into some other studies that came about and some reports. Now there have been a good handful of reports on the activity alone especially concerning stimulus in mice. The results do show activity with the kappa opioid receptors, and based off the structure and relation it has, I don't think this is very surprising. And we're going to kind of jump around here with the studies, but a big finding that came a few years later, which was unexpected, was even a stronger derivative than the methoxymethyl ether. What came up was Salvinorin B ethoxymethyl ether, 
which is currently one of the strongest selective kappa opioid agonists to date, being an estimated 10 times as potent as savonorinate. Technically, this makes it one of the most potent psychedelics out there, comparable to LSD, as a threshold dose would be considered to be around 10 to 50 micrograms, while a more standard dose is estimated to be around 150 to 300 micrograms. Not exactly as potent as LSD, but still technically, this makes it one of the strongest and most potent naturally occurring substances. That is if the ethoxy version can exist in the environment. But man, again, salvia, times 10, times fucking 10 man, like, the normal experience can be such a head fuck, but 10 times that? Just nuts. Besides the direct potency, the proteins are similar and so are the binding affinities compared to salvinorin A, but it has been found that salvinorin B is around 13 to 70 times more potent at inducing internalization. This is a process which involves the transfers of receptors from the plasma membrane to the membranes of the endosomal compartment. And this is tied with receptor downregulation, where the number of target cell receptors decrease. It can also induce prolonged receptor signaling on intracellular membranes. In other words, this could be why it's known to have a longer duration. And speaking of which, I don't think we talked about it in depth, but the trip is thought to be over the course of 2-3 to three hours, instead of the quick 10 or 15 minutes. So not only that much more potent, but like 10 times as long as well. It's still thought to have a similar quick onset though. But this isn't completely studied, and there is a lot of speculation as to why it's so much more potent. That specific part, why are these parts of Salvinorin B so much stronger? Well, we don't know exactly yet. Some speculate that the additional oxygen could increase the binding affinity, something that there may be an entirely different interaction that isn't being detected. Then some think that there may be a special deep cleft in the receptors that is better suited for ethoxy. All of these could hold some truth. What we do know is, these versions of salvia are potent as hell. It's thought that the C2 position could be responsible, that the methyl ester and furon ring are critical for making it possible. Main reason being is, this is the area that was altered during the original synthesis of salvinorin B. So this suggests C2 is strongly involved with the kappa opioid receptors. But let's get back into some of the effects and how it stands out more. It does share a similar, if not stronger impact on motor control to salvinorin A really incapacitating subjects completely when they get into stronger doses. Another effect somewhat comparable could be its effect on pain relief. Salvia is somewhat known to have analgesic properties, but with how strong these salvinorin B derivatives can be, it seems that there's a lot more potential here in its usage. A negative side effect of this extreme potency could be lower body temperature, so much so that hypothermia could be possible. This was examined to be present all the way up to 90 minutes after dosing possibly longer. To reverse such effects, an opioid antagonist is used. A common example, I'm probably going to butcher this, norbinotorphamine, or for short, norbni. When this is present with salvinorin B, we can see a reduction in hypodermic effects, plus other effects like the pain relief, which this is a highly selective kappa opioid antagonist, further indicating that the effects of salvinorin B are indeed involved with the kappa opioid receptors. Beyond that, there is a study suggesting that salvinorin B promotes remyelination. This can be hugely significant for some disorders out there. Multiple sclerosis is a common example. It's a process in which nerve cells and covers become damaged in the brain and central nervous system. With these findings though, alongside possibly treating this, there may also be a link to reversing weight loss. Mice treated with salvinorin B found an increase in weight. Whether this is a healthy balancing or a direct increase in weight isn't too clear, but the effects of remyelination are more defined, and does suggest that salvia could have very similar cognitive benefits as those found in some psychedelic substances. But let's move into this one very interesting study we can find on Earwood, originally published in the Atheogen Review. I say interesting because instead of mice, there were four actual human subjects recruited for this. They gave salvia B the name of symmetry which I won't read any of these reports here, but I did present one of them in a trip report video, which is what inspired this really. Go check out Cemetery Delta if you haven't heard it yet to see what this trip can be like. But the doses in their support varied, some all the way down to 150 micrograms, all the way up to 1350 micrograms. It varied for each person and it was smoked. They noted peak effects came on as quickly as a minute and began to diminish after only five minutes. 
though the residual effects were still very noticeable after a half hour, and back to baseline after 2 hours. Which, this seems to be somewhat different from what was found in mice, at least concerning things like motor control loss and hypothermia, as those effects were still present long after it was administered. But in this study, they did use a scale called the Peak Experience Profile, which we won't write that down here, but it can be commonly used in some psychedelic studies to discern a level of spirituality and mysticism experienced in a trip. Which, to put this simply, psychoactive and psychedelic effects did correlate with the increase in dosage, suggesting this does produce an active psychedelic trip, which the subjective responses from the subjects obviously state this. But in terms of unpleasantness and mood, they seem to be unrelated to the dosage. And based on the results, the unpleasantness of the salvia still do triumph any positive effects. But in terms of the subject's trips, a lot does happen and vary for each person. Their different perspectives really do show variances, but some base things that were experienced include geometric visuals, open and closed eye visions, different visual alterations, confusion, derealization, after images, and a general foreboding feeling. So quite a mix, and some things that are definitely defining of what we know Salvia Devonorum to be like. Though after a month, all subjects reported enjoying their experiences and would be willing to try it again. And they leave the study off where we leave things off for today. And that is, this is a very peculiar and interesting substance that deserves more research. But the question is, is that research going to come? Probably at some point, but like they suggested, this is a substance unlikely to become popular out of nowhere. Who knows though, if the right attention and interest sparks, it could turn into something. It's been two decades though since any research or anything has come up about it, so only time will tell. We basically covered all the significant research there is out there with this Salvinor and B video. If I miss something big or even just another study with it, do let me know, as we may eventually have a follow up on this at some point in time. I definitely would like to cover some of these reports though, as apparently there are a few out there that exist beyond this last study as well. But we'll end things here. Let me know if you enjoyed this, and make sure to like and subscribe. Check out the memberships and the Patreon, and do let me know what you guys want to see next. It's been someone that's no one, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.